participants, including teaching faculty and uh, students, uh, not only from Bangalore, from also from elsewhere, they have joined. Uh, before beginning uh, that talk, let me give a brief uh, overview of achievements of uh, Dr. Priya Hassan, Madam. Dr. Priya Hassan is an assistant professor in physics at the, at the prestigious Maulana Azhar National Urdu University, Hyderabad. She did her integrated masters from the Moscow State University, Moscow, Russia, and a PhD from another renowned university, Osmana, Ospania University, Hyderabad, in 2004. And a postdoctoral research she carried out in France and Ayuka, Pune. She was awarded the Women Scientist Award by Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, in 2006. On behalf of KSTA, congratulations to you, madam. She, she has presented her work in various conferences in India, Europe, and US, and in also in the United Nations, Vienna. Her research interests are in observational astronomy, star formation, star clusters, and galaxies. She is actively involved in Olympiad, public outreach, and science popularization programs, and has worked on various projects with the IAU, uh, US Consulate Hyderabad, etc. She is the co-chair of the Women in Astronomy, WG, IAU, and uh, member of the Public Outreach and uh, Education Committee, Astronomical Society of India, uh, and I ISDT and uh, TMD. This uh, brief introduction to, to her achievement, let me welcome Dr. Priya Hassan, madam, to deliver her talk on the Golden Eye James Webb Space Telescope. Over to you, madam, for your presentation. Uh, Thank one you, more thing. Yeah. Madam, uh, just a moment. This uh, webinar is being organized collaboratively, uh, jointly in association with National College Jainagar. As you know, National College Jainagar is also a very renowned and very old uh, college in Bangalore. Many renowned and uh, distinguished scientists, academicians have studied there. Uh, I welcome all the National College uh, faculty to this webinar. Now over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ramesh sir. Thank you for your kind introduction. And thank you, Kamla ma'am, for inviting me to talk to all of you all. It's indeed a pleasure to get a chance to talk to all of you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, <clears throat> so today I'm gonna be talking about the James Webb Telescope which most of you all have are aware of. It's lots in the news now. There's a lot you are hearing about it. And uh, I would like to talk about that and let you know what's the big thing about James Webb. Why are we also excited about James Webb? Now, uh, the story of telescopes starts about 400 years back, more than 400 years back, with Galileo being the first one who actually directed a telescope onto the skies. And uh, that itself was a major milestone in astronomy. Uh, in principle, the telescope that Galileo used was a very small telescope, but the kind of discoveries that, that Galileo made with that telescope were such strong discoveries, which were you know, enough to actually uh, get him into trouble in a way, because he discovered things, for example, that there are other systems which have satellites. For example, Jupiter has satellites. He noticed the phases of Venus, which were actually difficult to explain on the basis of the geocentric theory. He noticed the craters on the moon. In short, with that small telescope of his, he actually discovered some things which were very path-breaking and which were very different from what were the notions at that time of what people thought about the stars and the planets. And therefore, a simple act of just looking with the small telescope itself was so important that you can imagine that now when we are using bigger and bigger telescopes to look at the skies, how important and how path breaking can our discoveries be? The other important thing about using telescopes is that not everything is visible, right? So we know with our eyes, our eyes are sensors to a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now I've shown you a picture here of the electromagnetic spectrum, which ranges in wavelengths of frequencies. So what, hap what happens is that uh, high frequencies or short wavelengths, you have gamma rays and X-rays. And as you increase the wavelength, you move from optical to infrared, to radio and other regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
But a uh, visible light, that is the kind of light that we see with our eyes, is only a very small fraction of this electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, different physical processes which take place in objects, they actually emit light in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And therefore, it becomes very essential for us to even observe that kind of radiation. In the sense, the radiation which is not visible to our eyes, but is available, which, which, which is emitted in the radio region, the X-ray region, the gamma ray region, other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And hence, we obviously need detectors or which can actually detect this kind of radiation. Another thing which we also have is we have a protecting atmosphere, right? So what you see is here, you can see the different levels of the atmosphere, the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, there are different layers of the atmosphere. You can actually see from space, you can actually see this faint haze, which is there above the surface of the earth, which is the atmosphere. And this very atmosphere is uh, what actually protects us, right? It's a very important part of the earth and of habitability in the sense it's a very important thing which actually protects life for us because uh, uh, it actually uh, cuts off x-ray radiation gamma ray radiation ultraviolet uh, radiation which actually uh, which are very essential for human life right so if we did not have this protective atmosphere around us then we would not uh, you know life would not be protected in that way and we see that, for example, Mars. Mars is a neighboring planet where we constantly look for life. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. And that is essentially one uh, factor which actually reduces the habitability of Mars. And um, so we are actually very thankful for the presence of our atmosphere. But the problem is that the atmosphere works like a blanket. So what does the atmosphere do? Like I mentioned, it actually cuts off certain radiations. So you see that high energy radiations or high frequency radiations, for example, X-rays, ultraviolet, the atmosphere is completely opaque to that. And therefore, we do not have any of that radiation which comes onto the surface of the Earth. You see visible light comes in through the surface. And uh, then we have a few windows which are in the infrared, in the microwave, which actually come to the uh, surface of the Earth. And then you have the radio window. The radio window is the largest window, which actually comes onto the surface of the Earth. And then again, you have a blocking like this. So you can see that because of our atmosphere, a certain part of radiation, of electromagnetic radiation, does not come to us. And it, uh, it, it you know, we are cut off from that. And like I mentioned, if you look at, for example, this is our galaxy in different wavelengths. So you can see how it looks in millimeter wavelength, invisible, in X-ray, etc. And like I mentioned, there are different physical processes which emit in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And therefore, different components of the galaxy, in the sense gas, dust, a different kind of components which will emit in different radiations. And therefore, we actually need to look at our galaxy in different light. When we look at the galaxy in different light on different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can actually see different processes, physical processes taking place in the galaxy, which are very important for our understanding of the galaxy and what's happening. And therefore, it's very essential that we look at our galaxy with different eyes and different light. Right? Uh, so here I have another image where you can actually see this certain galaxy called the Whirlpool Galaxy. And you can see that if you look at it in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, if you look at it in radio, you will see the emission coming from cold gas. If you look at it in optical, in infrared, you will see that coming from the cold stars. In optical, you would see from sunlight stars. In ultraviolet, you will see from the hotter stars. And if you actually see it in X-ray, you would see as it comes from hot gas, right? And therefore, what happens is it's very essential for us to look at our uh, uh, galaxy from different wavelengths, right? And uh, that's the very part of uh, what we're talking about is that, like I also mentioned, that if we do not consider the galaxy um, in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, 
then we would not have an idea of the different physical processes that are taking place. So you have the image here of the blind blind men, blind women, and you can see that how the picture of the elephant looks very different if you only look at one component. And therefore, if you if you were to observe the galaxy only in the optical path, we would only see certain physical processes, right? And not the other physical processes. The other important part about space astronomy, I'm trying to justify why do we need to do astronomy in space, is the thing of what is called seeing. In astronomy, we have a concept which is called seeing, which tells you about how well can you look at an object in the sense of seeing details from the object. Now, if you look at this observer over here, you have the atmosphere and you have the observer looking at the sky and you can see that the position of this star is actually varying because of turbulence in the atmosphere. So when this object looks at this star over here, you can actually see that um, number one, if you are looking from a telescope, you can see uh, this and you can see multiple images. And here what you can see in this image is this is an image which is badly resolved in which you cannot see detail. Typically, if you have a lot of wind or you have a lot of turbulence in the atmosphere, you will have this thing. But if you have a much more better seeing or with which you can resolve objects, you will see stars separately like this in the form of these clear spots, right? Here also I have another example of a turbulent sky where if you were looking at the image of Jupiter, you will actually see it's slightly distorted and in this kind of a way, right? So therefore, because of our atmosphere, we have this problem of diffraction. Diffraction is anyway there because light is a wave and you have the effects of diffraction, which anyway, you know, blur out our seeing. But so this is anyway something we have to live with even in space. But when you're looking through the earth, you again had the added effect of turbulence in the atmosphere. And that actually spoils our seeing in the sense we cannot see as clearly as we would like to. And now this comes to my main justification as why do we now need to go into space? What is the basic idea of sending a telescope in space? So the first reason, like I mentioned, was that certain wavelengths like X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolets, mid-infrared, far-infrared, these do not pass through our atmosphere. Like I showed you, there's a blanket created by the atmosphere due to which we cannot access these wavelengths from the surface of the Earth. The other problem is, one is the diffraction-limited seeing, which anyway is there because of the wave nature of light, but you have the additional seeing problem caused by turbulence in the atmosphere. And then ground-based telescopes have limited observing time because of the Earth's rotation. While space telescopes, if you send a telescope in space, it is basically free of the Earth's surface, and therefore they can spend a longer time actually observing targets, right? You do not have to live with the day-night cycle. And therefore, uh, we, we actually find it very essential to send out telescopes in space. And uh, space telescopes are either classified as survey missions or observatories. Some of them are missions which just keep looking at the sky and, uh, uh, you know, studying the sky. And uh, the other ones could be observatories where you have targeted observations or pointed observations. And uh, depending on the kind of science you want to do with the telescopes, you can actually have them as survey missions or as observatories. The disadvantages with, surface, with space telescopes is that obviously they are far more expensive to build because you have to build the telescope, launch it out into space. And therefore, once you send it out in space, uh, it's obviously very difficult to maintain. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope was actually serviced. They actually had servicing missions for the Hubble Space Telescopes, right? But the Hubble Space Telescope is only at the height of 550 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So in principle, that's not very far away. It's actually shorter the distance between Hyderabad and Bangalore, right? Which uh, I could have done had I actually come in person. But uh, so in principle, servicing the Hubble Space Telescope was not a difficult task because it's not so very far away. But obviously that does cost a lot of money and a lot of planning because you need to send the service mission all out in space, right? So that's the disadvantage of space telescopes. But it was realized, like I said, that it is obviously very essential to have uh, telescopes out in space for the reasons which I explained to you, right? 
that you are number one going to access uh, telescopes which are accessible in wavelengths from space, which are not accessible from the ground. So, for example, an X-ray telescope is only possible in space. You cannot have one from the ground, right? The other essential things, like I told you about seeing, if you go out in space, you only have diffraction limited seeing. You have no other problems with seeing, as well as uh, the the amount of time in which you can observe. Right? And therefore, this was as early as 1946, where even Spitzer had actually proposed a telescope out in space. And then there are various space telescopes which have been, you know, uh, which have been in, in action. Some of them are still working. Some of them were planned, done earlier. You have the popular ones over here, for example, the Chandra Space Telescope, which observes in the X-ray. You have Kepler, which is observing exoplanets, Spitzer in the infrared. You have Hubble, which all of you all know about the space telescope, 2.4 meter telescope out in space. And you have XMM Newton, you have Suzaku. There are a whole bunch of space telescopes which are already out there observing in different wavelengths and giving us very important and very interesting science. Now, like I mentioned, space is literally out of this world. So here you have an image of the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched by the Space Shuttle. And uh, you can see that this was launched in 1990, and it has led to some very interesting discoveries and very important things in astronomy, right? The other important observatory I was talking to you about was Chandra. This is an X-ray telescope, which observes in X-rays. Like I'm telling you, inaccessible from the Earth. It has to be done with this. It has various instruments, which give you something very important about X-ray data. So there are some specific things which can be observed specifically in the X-rays, which has been possible with Chandra. Chandra is still very much operational, like the Hubble. And here you have some examples I can show you. Uh, hello, is there some? Yeah, here I can show you some various examples of observations where this is coupled observations of, for example, Chandra with Hubble Space Telescope. Here you have the Chandra showing you the hot gas and you have Hubble Space Telescope in this and they're combined showing you physical processes. For example, this is the galaxy M82, where with Chandra, you can see the outflows, you can see over here in blue, and you can also see the galaxy itself, right? I won't go into these details because we are waiting to talk about James Webb. But I thought this was essential for the baseline. Gamma ray is also with the Compton Observatory. Spitzer is a very important telescope. It's a smaller telescope at 0.85 meters, but it observes in wavelengths, uh, which we are soon going to talk about, 3.6 to 160 microns. That's the kind of wavelengths which Spitzer observes in. And then there's Herschel, which was done by the European Space Agency, which was active from 2009 to 2030. 3.5 meter telescope observing in far infrared and some millimeters. Now, NASA planned the Great Observatories Program, which was actually combining the effect of all the space observatories, which included the Hubble Space Telescope, the Compton Grammar Gray, the Chandra Telescope and X-ray, and the Spitzer. So combining all these, NASA had this Great Observatories Program, or the GOODS Program. We also have another space telescope, which is also popular in present times, which is called TESS. TESS is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. This is kind of the successor to Kepler mission. And TESS is essentially, uh, it was launched three years back, where it, uh, four years back rather, where it basically looks for exoplanets. Right? It's like I said, the successor to the Kepler mission. The Kepler telescope was uh, an earlier telescope, which basically its job was to look for exoplanets by scanning a certain part of the sky in detail. Astrometry is also something very important, which we can do from space, where you can actually see the precise movements of stars. So you can see this cluster where this, uh, sorry, this constellation, which you see on the left, this is Saptarishi or the Big Dipper, where you can see that these individual stars have motions, right? And these motions are obtained by observing these stars over long periods of time. And these are, you see the period of time that I mentioned over here, these are thousands of years, where you can see how the shape of the Saptarishi constellation is actually, or the Big Dipper, Arsa Major, is changing with time, depending upon the motion of stars, right? And this can be done if you very accurately measure the motions of stars, which is also something which is 
specifically better possible from space compared to ground based because in space you don't have the problem of the turbulence of the atmosphere so you have diffraction limited seeing with which you can observe with great accuracy so hipparchus was a satellite which had this job of basically uh, very precisely measuring the motions of stars which it did for 2.5 million stars okay this is 20 years back so, so this was basically doing the job of measuring space velocity or the velocities of stars in different directions, right? So one is in the plane of sky, which you have over here, which is measured in what is called proper motion. And the other motion is what is called radial motion, which is measure, which is observed by measuring the Doppler shifts of satellite of objects by doing their radial velocities. And now there's the most popular satellite, which is a lot in the news, which is Gaia, which is a satellite of the ESA, the European Space Association Agency which actually very accurately measures the, uh, um, this thing. And this is also an important this thing because this is at the L2 point, which we are going to talk about very soon. And uh, this is sitting over there. So Gaia actually very accurately measures the positions and velocities and distances to stars in our galaxy. Now with this, I just set the base about space telescopes and why is it so important for us to send telescopes in space, right? And like you see, we already have a big history of telescopes in space, right? Of all the telescopes we have in space. Hubble being amongst the most popular telescopes in space because it has a size of about 2.4 meters, right? And what you can see is that Hubble has a whole bunch of instruments on it, uh, which are, uh, for example, there is the NICMOS camera, which is observing in the infrared, and you have the ACS optical camera and a spectrometer, et cetera, which is there on Hubble. Now, uh, we won't go into details, but if you Google and you actually look at the images given out by Hubble, you'll actually see various images which have come out because of Hubble, right? And uh, that's when now we start talking about James Webb. So James Webb was is often considered the successor to Hubble. And I'll tell you why it is and it's not the successor to Hubble. But uh, Hubble has a size of about 2.4 meters. That's the size of the Hubble, this thing. While James Webb has a size of 6.5 meters. Okay, so it's about a factor almost three times larger than the size of Hubble, right? If you were to compare the size with a human being, this is the size of Hubble. And here you have the size of James Webb. And uh, James Webb was essentially designed to study the origins. It was an origins telescope, which was to basically to study the origins of stars, galaxies, planets, etc., and look back where galaxies were young. Okay. So the idea was basically to work like a time machine where it's going to look back in time at objects as they were very far away, right? And uh, therefore, it's like I said, it's it's supposed to be a time travel machine where it's basically looking at the universe as it was a long time back. Now, there are three big space agencies which are involved in the development of James Webb. The first one being NASA, the second one being the European Space Agency, and the third is the Canadian Space Agency. So these are the uh, three big space agencies which are involved in the development of James Webb. There are also a lot of other countries and space agencies which have also contributed to these things, but the big ones are these. And uh, like I said, Often people think of the James Webb as the successor to Hubble. In principle, it's a successor in the sense it's the big billion dollar kind of project. Hubble was the large billion dollar kind of project and um, James Webb costs 11 billion. It's the big starship, you know, the big mission. But the difference in Hubble and James Webb is that Hubble essentially observes in the ultraviolet, the optical and very little of the infrared. So essentially it looks in the wavelength region of 0.1 to about one micrometers. That's the kind of wavelength range which you have with Hubble. But Webb, James Webb is essentially an infrared telescope. And very soon I'll just tell you in a bit, why is it looking in the infrared? Why is infrared important? And therefore, if you see the wavelength coverage of Webb is not exactly the wavelength coverage of Hubble. So in principle, uh, the wavelength coverage of James Webb is similar to that of Spitzer. 
I spoke to you already about Spitzer, which is an infrared telescope out in space of a size of about 0.84 millimeters. And the wavelength coverage of James Webb is similar to that of Spitzer, a little bit with Herschel too, because it's looking in the infrared. So in that sense, I, we would call uh, um, Webb to be more a successor of Spitzer and less a successor of Hubble in terms of wavelength coverage. Now, uh, the expertise, like I told you, it was divided amongst different space agencies. It costs about uh, 11 billion dollars. NASA has been handling the, the mirror, the sunshade. We'll talk about it in detail in a bit. ESA has been, uh, the, the launch of James Webb happened from Kuru, which is essentially a, a launch site for ESA. That's exactly where Gaia was also launched for. And that's where James Webb was launched from on Christmas Day. As well as ESA is handling the uh, very important instrument, which is there on James Webb, which is called the MIRI, which is the mid-infrared camera. Canada also has been very active in space, this thing. I've added more about uh, Canada over here because people are not aware about the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, they have actually been very, their, their, their expertise lies in robotic arms. So the robotic arms, which you see for the space station, for Hubble Space, etc., all were developed essentially by the Canadian Space Agency. And in the James Webb, they are basically handling the NIRES, which is the near infrared uh, camera spectroscope. And uh, that's their contribution on to James Webb. Now, like I mentioned to you, uh, James Webb is, um, in that sense, a jump from Spitzer. But in terms of big missions, it is from Hubble. And like I told you, you are increasing your uh, the size of it by a factor of almost three by 2.7. And therefore, you actually increase the area corresponding to uh, the, the coverage which you're going to get with this, right? And obviously, that means better spatial resolution uh, than Spitzer, for example. And because the size is much, Spitzer was only 0.84. Here, you're moving to 6.5 meters with James Webb, right? So another important, let us try to see the differences between James Webb and Hubble. Like I mentioned to you, Hubble is just at a height of about 550, 70 meters, uh, kilometers above the surface of the Earth. It's very close to the Earth. And therefore, Hubble has had various servicing missions. We've actually had missions where people have gone and physically, uh, you know, adjusted, made certain adjustments with Hubble. And that has happened at the servicing missions. But James Webb has been actually planned and is actually, today is the grand day where where James Webb will actually reach the position that it's supposed to have, and that is the L2 point, the Lagrange point, which is at a distance of about 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. So uh, James Webb has actually traveled from its launch date, uh, 29 days, to actually reach the L2 point, which is exactly today. So this talk has been very well timed, uh, where you actually have James Webb now landing on the L2 point. Now, this point is very far from the Earth. It's 1.5 million kilometers. And therefore, for James Webb, in principle, there are no servicing missions planned because it actually means going to such a distance of 1.25 million kilometers, which James Webb actually took a month to reach there, right? Reaching Hubble is not very difficult. It's reasonably close by, but James Webb is really very far. Uh, Hubble has a single mirror, which is made up of 2.5 meters size. But James Webb is actually made up of segments. Now we know that building single mirrors is a, is a difficult job. So segmented mirrors is the way forward with large uh, telescopes. And therefore we have James Webb in form of segments. Another important point about segments for James Webb is when James Webb was launched, right? You, we, the launch vehicle we have, Ariane 5, cannot take in the, the, um, the telescope in an unfolded form. And therefore, actually, what you'll see is the segments actually help the telescope to get folded. So the telescope actually got folded when it got launched. And that's what led to a, a lot of um, you know, planning for the telescope, because after the telescope was launched and sent out in space, the first thing the telescope had to do was to unflower, right? Open up so that it actually forms its whole primary mirror of 6.5 meters, right? And therefore, what you actually needed was uh, the unfolding of the telescope. 
So the segments help you to have 6.5 meters, but they have to be unfolded after the launch, which is a, something which required a lot of detailed planning uh, for the James Webb. And uh, in this case, uh, the, the telescope, the mirror, is not kept in a tube. In the case of Hubble, the telescope is in the tube, which you could see over here, right? It's uh, we had it over here. Uh, here you have this tube in which Hubble is placed. But in the case of James Webb, you will actually see it's an interesting telescope where you do not have a tube. Like uh, uh, telescopes do not need to have tubes, right? Often people think that a telescope means a tube, but that's not essential. What you essentially need is your primary mirror, right? And uh, uh, since this telescope is, um, these are not enclosed in a, in a tube, and that is something which is very essential for the cooling of the telescope, right? And I'll talk to you why we do we need cooling to take place, right? And like I mentioned, it's launched by Ariane 5 to send to the L2 point, right? Uh, the problem is that because we'll come to that in a little while, that there's a difference even in the mission length of how long do we expect James Webb to last compared to Hubble. Hubble is still operational, but James Webb will have may have some problems. So let us just now see uh, what is the importance of having um, James Webb working in the infrared. Now, most of you all are aware of Edwin Hubble. He is the pioneering astronomer who actually got us the whole concept of the expanding universe. So this is a, a picture of um, Hubble observing from Mount Wilson. And what Hubble actually observed when he was doing spectroscopy of galaxies is that he noticed that galaxies, the further the way, the, they are from us, they seem to be moving with larger velocities, right? Now, the further, the distance to galaxies, he found out by observing certain kind of variable stars called cepheids, which have a pulsation time proportional to their luminosity, with which you can find out the distance. So he could find out the distance and he could measure the velocity, so the distance on the y axis on the x-axis using cepheids and the velocities using spectroscopy. He got these plots of distance versus velocities for galaxies, okay, using the Mount Wilson telescope. And he got a straight line fit like this, which basically means that velocities increase as the distances increase. And this essentially is what we know is the Doppler effect, right? Which you observe in spectroscopy, if you have your source of light moving faster away, you basically have it moving to longer wavelengths, right? To actually having it moving as red shifted, right? Which is something which we observe even with sound. With sound also we observe Doppler effect, which is the moving to longer wavelengths, right? But this was taken as a very important observational proof of what is called cosmological redshift or the proof that the universe is expanding. And uh, uh, here, if you were to actually, so if you want to actually look back at the earlier universe, the emission which came out from, say, for example, early stars, if you were to say that the emission is coming out in the optical, but because they are, it's part of the expanding universe, therefore these objects are moving away. So the emission which they gave in optical light is now observable in infrared light, right, in longer wavelengths. And therefore, if I want to study the origin of the universe, or if I want to study objects which are very far away, I will have to observe it infrared because their original optical wavelength is now going to get shifted to the infrared wavelength, right? So therefore, if I want to look back in time, looking at the origin of the universe, I need to observe in infrared in longer wavelengths right, rather than looking at the optical light. Why? Because the optical light which came out from these very far away uh, sources of light, which are associated with the original of the universe, is now going to be an infrared in longer wavelengths. And hence, I need to now observe it in infrared. And therefore, by looking in infrared, you can go back to very early redshifts. So you can go back to redshifts of even 20 or 30 by looking back in uh, you know, looking at infrared wavelengths. And therefore, what happens is if you want to actually look at longer wavelengths, if you see with ground-based telescopes, we could barely go back to wavelengths of about 6 billion years because you cannot see much more back in infrared, right? With Hubble Deep Field, we can go to a time period of about 1.5 billion years. Hubble also has a NICMOS camera, which looks in the near infrared. The ultra, ultra Deep Field, we look even deeper. And now with James Webb, we can actually go back 
even further back in time to redshifts greater than 20 because we are now looking at the infrared, right? And uh, this is another image just to show you what do we mean by redshift. This basically means that supposing I have a source of light which is emitting over here, right, in these kind of wavelengths, right? Then what happens? The same spectral line gets shifted to longer wavelengths. So if you were seeing this, this for example, at a redshift of 5.7, if I were to observe it at a redshift of 8.42, it would be shifted further to the infrared part. And therefore, that's the justification which we have as to why do we look in infrared, right? So why do we want to look in infrared? The most important reason is, is that, that we can look, look at the early universe. We can look at the earliest stars. We can look at the earliest galaxies. We can look at the earliest part of the universe because they are what emits in infrared, right? The other important part of looking in the infrared is here you can see an image of Orion. Most of you all are aware of it. And here you can see Orion in the, in the infrared. So here you can see is that when you look in the infrared, you can actually look at very dusty regions. And dusty regions, the problem is in the optical, you cannot observe them because all the light gets, gets absorbed by optical light. Right, but if you want to look at it in, in uh, look at it, you have to look at it in infrared, and therefore with infrared we can also look at dusty extincted regions or regions of early star formation, and therefore if you are looking at atmospheres, for example, of exoplanets, right, these are lying in very dusty regions because these are regions of star formation where stars are forming, and therefore in those regions you will have to look in the infrared, right. Similarly, you can also look for debris disks, that is disks around very young stars where young planets are forming and that can be observable only with the infrared. The other important reason which I was telling you is you can look at high redshift sources. So, for example, if you're looking at stars or galaxies or any sources at higher redshift, they are going to essentially emit in the infrared and that's what you can observe using the, in, using the, the infrared. And therefore, uh, a lot of uh, planned observations can be done he also with, uh, with James Webb using the infrared. If you were to look at, for example, what is the advantage you're getting with infrared? This is, these are the pillars of creation. You can see Eagle Nebula. And you can see this is how it looks in Hubble because there's a lot of gas and dust and you cannot look through it. But if you were to look at the same part using, um, using for example, infrared, you can see individual stars. Because with infrared, you can actually look through inf infrared, this thing. And therefore, if we look at wavelength coverage, this is the wavelength coverage for the Hubble Space Telescope. This is for Spitzer. And James, Dub James Webb actually starts from here and ends somewhere over here. And this is the kind of wavelength coverage you're going to have with using uh, James Webb, right? So if this is what you had with Hubble in 2.4 meter, this is how the resolution will improve as you are also improving the size of the telescope. Uh, Herschel, like I mentioned, this is a telescope, which is a 3.5 meter telescope, which is observing in this thing. So in a way, uh, you, you have a certain amount of overlap also of the wavelength coverage of Webb as well as Hubble. And therefore, how Herschel looks for active star forming regions and star forming galaxies. Similarly, even Webb will manage to look at sources of this kind, right? Because it is observing in the infrared. So uh, what's interesting about, let's come on to web. So web is made up of, like I told you, 18 segmented mirrors, which were folded when they were launched, right? And uh, what you have is that, uh, so the, the, uh, if you see that we had this folding taking place, each of these segments was of a size of 1.32 meters. And uh, these ones actually were made, uh, yeah. The other thing is that on each of these mirrors, under them, you have what is called accentuators. Accentuators are things that can help you adjust this mirror. So what happens is all these pieces form together and they have to be adjusted so that they are perfectly aligned. They have to be as well aligned as the wavelength, okay, which is approximately 1 upon 10,000, the thickness of human hair. So the precision has to be of the order of lambda of the wavelength of light so that these segments get correctly aligned to form a perfect primary mirror, right? That is one of the jobs. The other important job which has to be done is that this needs to observe in infrared. If it observes in infrared, you know that you and me, we are very good infrared emitters, 
right? And therefore, what happens is you even these instruments are going to be infrared emitters, and hence they have to be very well cooled. So what you're seeing is that they have to be cooled to a temperature of about 40 degrees absolute zero, right? Minus 220 degrees centigrade, something really, really cold. And this is done by cryogenic cooling. And uh, that is also something very essential. And that is what is associated to the lifetime of James Webb. Because the cryogenic cooling is done with, uh, with cryogenic technology, which has that material, which then gets diffused. And therefore, you cannot contain it for long enough time. And therefore, uh, James Webb only has a lifetime of about five, 10 years, because that's the time for which the cryogenic uh, material will, su will survive. While Hubble, we do not need cryogenic technology for that because it's observing in the optical and near infrared, for which we do not need that kind of cooling. So the kind of cooling which is there in space is sufficient. But here, what we need is we need cryogenic cooling, which therefore defines the, uh, the lifetime. The other important thing is that its orbit is about 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. And therefore, to keep it cool, we need sun shields. Okay, and therefore, along with the mirror, a very important component is these are the sun shields. So there are five sun shields. These have a thickness of you know barely human hair, but there are five different layers on it, which will help the mirror stay cool. So what you see is these are the primary mirror segments. We have the second. There's also a secondary mirror, a tertiary mirror, and a fine steering mirror. So they essentially four mirrors which also so that's the primary that's the secondary and then from this path inside you lead to the tertiary and the fine steering mirrors this is the primary this is the secondary right and uh, <clears throat> right so uh, the other important component like i told you is the sun shield so this is the sun shield which is huge it is a size of about 20 meters across and it's made up of five layers okay where each layer is as thin as a human hair okay it's made up from a special material polyamide material which is called dew point which are specially coated with aluminium on both sides as well as doped silicon and essentially it is what um, you know protects the telescope so you don't have any tube the telescope has no tube it essentially has this sun shield which protects the telescope and here you have this open primary mirror on which the light falls it bounces off the secondary and then gets into this part, which will lead to the tertiary mirror, right? And uh, this whole thing has to be cold, okay? It has to be so cold that it's barely 40 degrees above absolute zero, which is achieved by the sun shield, which is actually protecting it from this thing, as well as the cryogenic technology, which you have for cooling it, right? So that is the sun shield. Now, where is James Webb launched and where it is as it arrived today? Today itself is the day where the uh, where um, JWST has landed at the L2 point. Now, if you look at the Sun Earth system, there are five points which are called the Lagrange points where you have the gravitational force being balanced. OK, now L1 is the ideal point you will put any, uh, you know, any observatory or a satellite which needs the sun. Okay, for example, SOHO or even Aditya, which is the Indian satellite mission, which is going to go to the sun in this year or next year, very soon. It's going to go to this L2, L1 point because it directly looks at the sun. But these telescopes, for example, JWST or even Gaia, these telescopes do not want sunlight because sunlight can saturate their instruments. And therefore, they sit on this L2 point, right? This L2 point over here which is on the back side. It is in the Earth's shadow, so it's always going to be protected. And this is the JWST, so it's protected, as well as you have this uh, sun shield, which is protecting the mirror and everything. But you also have, uh, you have solar arrays, which will get the power from the sun. That's also there. That's an important component. So L2 point is the point at which JWST is there. Like I told you, it's 1.5 million kilometers away from this, from the um, from the Earth, protected from the solar rays, right? And that's where L2 is there. That's where it's supposed to orbit. It's supposed to do what is called a halo orbit, not exactly sit over there. Slightly move around in that area. And uh, the, I, 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 this is the link is gone, and I think I don't have time. But there are actually images of people observing the movement of JWST as it was going to the L2 point. 
So where is web now? If you can actually find it even from the position of the moon. So like I told you is that if this is the earth, right? This is the sun, right? And the web is sitting behind it. This is sitting over here. So for example, if you were to look at the, the full moon, it's going to be something somewhere behind it. But if you were to look at the crescent moon and you look at the opposite side, this is the direction in which you need to look for the James Webb, right? This is it. So it is um, it is, uh, it is in the sky because the darkest part of the moon shadow is always pointing towards L2. So this is actually going to tell you where James Webb is in the sky, right? So what are the instruments on the James Webb? There's a near infrared camera, which has been developed by the University of Arizona. There is the near infrared spectrograph, which I told you about the European Space Agency is doing it. There's the mid infrared instrument also, which is being done by Jet Propulsion as well as ESA. This is MIRI, and there's the fine guidance sensor, which is done by the Canadian Space Agency. So all these are different instruments which are be, which are on the James Webb. Like I told you, the sun shield is here, the primary, the secondary, and uh, various other features on it. So uh, you can see here individual instruments as they were being developed. All of them were developed at different locations, at different places, and from where they were then taken to the final place. So if you actually see the James Webb is a pure engineering wonder, right? If you were to actually see the way the different components of it are built up, got together, and then gotten for the launch, right? So after they were developed in all these, this thing, they were actually packed up together where you had a complete testing taking place of the telescope and the, the machinery on it, right? So the, the James Webb was then packed up from where it was this thing, and literally sent on a barge. So you have this thing. Some of you may be aware that uh, the launch point, which you have that is at the French Mini. And uh, what they had to do is actually it was put on a barge, which took the web from California through the Panama Canal and went to South America. This is in the northern part of South America, where you have this uh, the eastern part, east, northeastern part of South America, where you have um, uh, French Mini where you have the launch taking place of the James Webb. So um, the plan as it was, and it is, is that you actually had uh, it being launched. And many of you all may have seen this live telecast, which took place of after the launch in 30 minutes, you had the telescope separating from the launch vehicle. And the first thing it actually had to do was to deploy the solar array, right? You want to uh, power the telescope with its uh, this thing. So you had the solar array being deployed. Then you had the antenna, right? Because the antenna is what with it used to actually communicate with the earth. The, the, the telescope will constantly be in communication with the earth. Then you had in 2.7 days, the sun shield actually opened up. And within three point, this thing, one days, the sun shield deployed. It, this was a very crucial point because the sun shield had to open up into its five layers. Uh, earlier in, in about four years back when this thing was, uh, you know, there was a practice run being done for it. The sun shield actually tore and that's why it had to be remade, which actually led to a delay. And so therefore in 5.5 days, the sun shield was totally deployed. And then you in nine days, you actually have the primary mirror segment. Like I told you, the telescope is 6.5 meters, but it had to be folded because when it was launched, the launch vehicle cannot let it go in this big size. So it was actually folded. And uh, you can see there's a picture over here of how it's folded, right? And the folding took place and it got launched in the folded form. And then what it had to do is after the launch took place, then the folded thing had to like open up, right? So what you see is that before it reached L2, this last one month has been a very crucial month and very, uh, you know, um, uh, critical month for uh, for astronomers and especially the teams who are involved in the planning of the James Webb, because the first thing, like I told you, is after solar array, the sun shield had to unfold, you know, the uh, 18 segments had to open up. Each of them will form different images. The four cameras, they have to be cooled, which are on the back end. And like I told you, ultimately, they have to achieve a temperature of about 40 degrees above absolute zero. And then there's another camera which is on there, which is the mid infrared camera. That is the one which has the cryogenic cooling, which has to be actually cooled to a temperature of 10 degrees above absolute zero. So that is the cryogenic part, 
which is further cooled, right? And all this thing has happened till the time it's reached L2. And congratulations for everyone because today is the day when James Webb has actually arrived at L2. Today is that day. And uh, I'm sorry, this video, I won't run it because we are falling, running short of time. I will, um, this video will also not run, uh, but you can probably, we, we, I'll just run through it. You can go through this thing, very beautiful video of how the James Webb is being deployed. Like I told you, first the solar array, then the sun sheet, then the unfolding of the primary mirror, then the coming out of the secondary mirror, and, uh, you know, it all being this thing. So this is the last view we had of the James Webb when it was launched. So uh, this is when it separated from the launch vehicle uh, 29 minutes after launch. And this was the last image which was taken of the, um, the James Webb telescope before it started its journey towards the L1, L2 point, right? And uh, so uh, what is planned is now it's already reached the L2 point. And the next six months is going to be a period where they are going to do alignment of the mirrors. There's going to be calibration of the mirrors. Uh, the cameras have got to get cooled. All the cooling has to take place. And there are already a whole bunch of early science programs which are planned. Uh, like I told you, one of the important programs for the James Webb is obviously exoplanets. And I told you that infrared is the right region in which one can actually study uh, exoplanets. So it's kind of difficult to do direct imaging with the James Webb, but the transit technique can be done. Spectroscopy can be done for planetary atmospheres to actually study the atmospheres of the planets. Debris disks around stars, very young stars can be uh, studied to actually see solar systems in formation. Then the big advantage of it being in infrared, which will let you see the earliest stars which formed in the universe, the first stars. We'll be able to study the first stars, the first galaxies of the universe can be observed in the infrared. Dark matter studies can be done by studying the orbits of stars. So if you actually, uh, uh, this is again to be done in the infrared where one can ideally study the orbits of stars, which get affected by the presence of dark matter. And therefore you can estimate dark matter because of studying of the orbits of stars, even gravitational lensing programs. And there are essentially 13 directors, uh, early release science programs, which are going to be run in this next six months, which are part of the testing and the calibration and the thing to actually see the performance of the telescope. Right? So uh, that's what we are all looking forward to the James Webb. So like I told you today, it has actually reached the L2 point after which all these uh, calibration exercises, cooling exercises, everything will be done. And these early science programs, which I was talking about, these are the ones will, which will get initiated, right? But obviously we have to wait for some time because the most important problem just now is alignment of the primary mirror. Like I told you, it has to be aligned to the level of a wavelength of light. And then the cooling of all the cameras, right? So that's already begun, but it's it's still in process. Uh, that is very essential for the cameras to actually observe anything. We need to cool them, right? And therefore, these early science programs uh, will start. So essentially, uh, we've been told you have to wait for another six or five months for these, these uh, things to start. But gradually, as the telescope will get operational, the early science programs will be planned, right? Which I've mentioned over here. And I'll, I'll like to conclude with... Uh, uh, you know, with the thing that this is a very exciting time in astronomy. We have imagined this. I mean, like I told you, James Webb is a engineering marvel. It's, you know, even the best of science fiction could have never planned something of this kind. You know, you fold a telescope, you launch it, you unfold it, send it to L2, cool it over there and observe, right? It's, it's, it's like it's beyond science fiction. And the kind of things which are happening in astronomy just now in today's times are something really very pathbreaking. So, there are two other telescopes which are, you know, in the pipeline. There's, Nan there's the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, which will be launched hopefully in 2027. There's the Euclid telescope, which is of ESA. And there are already talks of even a super Hubble in the sense of a still bigger telescope compared to Hubble, which is being planned for launch somewhere in the 2040s. So I would like to say that this is a very exciting time for astronomers and people who love astronomy because we have these great, you know, 
gold we have this golden eye which is the james webb and along with that we have a whole bunch of these other supplementary eyes telescopes which are being planned and which will hopefully uh, you know really change things in astronomy so a lot of exciting astronomy is what we look forward to with a lot of interesting data which will hopefully come from james webb as well as all these other telescopes which I've spoken to you about. So thanks a lot, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah I can hear you. It was a, a wonderful presentation, a crystal clear presentation. Uh, James Webb is an uh, epitome of uh, human mind, what human mind can think at this juncture of time. That's what I feel. There are uh, many science projects which are uh, the excellence of the human mind, including CERN and other projects. So James Webb is one step ahead of all that. So, and uh, you have given the explanation of what is James Webb, its structure, what it could do, uh, what is the future plans, uh, uh, aptly describing in the right day. That is today it has reached the L2 where it should be. And we are thankful to you for that. Uh, now over to uh, the people for the question. So as far dark matter is considered, Priya? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. What, what exactly uh, it is uh, looking for, the kind of data in order to understand dark matter? Yeah. So actually dark matter shows itself only gravitationally, right? So we cannot, uh, we, we, we do not observe any kind of emission from that matter. And that is why we call it dark matter. So, yes. uh, the, so we actually studies of dark matter are based by indirect observations. So, for example, uh, one can look at the orbits of stars in the you know outskirts of galaxies, and you can actually calculate what kind of gravitational force or what kind of uh, uh, influence should be there on that body so that it moves with those kind of velocities. Or, for example, if you are observing clusters of galaxies, right? Then you can actually calculate what kind of, uh, you know, if you have a whole bunch of these galaxies which make up a cluster, you need to know what kind of a gravitational potential will hold them or give them the kind of velocities which those galaxies have. And that is what is estimated. So to, to, so to study dark matter, we basically need to observe these objects, the motion of these objects, for example, for stars or for galaxies and clusters, we have to study their ob ob motions very accurately so that you can calculate the corresponding dark matter that can cause this kind of a gravitational effect, right? And so that's why we observe it. So James Webb would actually do that by observing, for example, I mentioned that cluster it's going to observe where it can actually accurately measure the velocities of galaxies in that cluster. And then you can actually calculate what would be the required amount of dark matter which can drive those kind of motions of those galaxies, right? So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Now, what the thing I was looking for is, this is profusely what we are doing right now. That is the rotational speed of galaxies and all other things, gravitational attraction and other things. We are looking for uh, identifying the dark matter. Hello? Yes, yes, yes. That's right. Yes. So now, the, what is this? Speciality of James Webb over the present technique. Present technique, I mean Hubble or uh, Chandra, whatever it has been discovered. Uh, so, what is that that is uh, characteristic is the one that I was looking for. You're saying specifically for dark matter or in general? In general, it's fine. We understood for dark yeah. matter. Ah, so, for dark matter, what it can do is it can do these kind of observations in dusty regions because it's doing infrared. Right. So, for example, uh, uh, you'd be aware of like the, the, the Nobel Prize, which went for galactic center observations of the galactic center, right, which went to uh, in 2020, right, for observations of that. Again, the galactic center is a very dusty region and therefore all those observations were basically done in the infrared. Because if you observe that region in optical, you won't be able to observe that. So, for example, uh, regions which Hubble observes which is observing in the optical, uh, if it is dusty, then Hubble cannot observe it. So James Webb can observe those regions, which are those dusty regions, uh, which will not come up in Hubble, right? So in that sense, it would actually help to look at. So typically centers of galaxies, for example, 
uh, again, which could have a lot of dust in it. You will not be able to observe that in uh, with say Hubble, for example. But with uh, with James Webb, you can crystal clear look through it because uh, near infrared looks through dust. That's the infrared advantage. So the big advantage of James Webb is infrared, and in a large telescope, which is really cooled. So that's Thanks. that would be. Thank you. Any other question from other participants? There are no questions. Okay. Kiran's uh, explanation was so simple and he covered okay. everything right from advantage to disadvantage. So most of us have understood what. In fact, very, madam, it was a very informative, scholarly, and uh, scholastic talk on James Webb telescope. Uh, I'm not a physicist, no, I've forgotten physics. I studied some 30 years back. Even then, I could pick up some few points about James Webb Telescope. The STA organizes many programs, offline and online, for uh, programs that we organize in future will be might include. Please accept and uh, tell. Please accept our invitation and deliver talk in future as well. Yes, yes sir. Recently, we signed an MOU with uh, the Jainagar National College. I am sure this is a very befitting beginning to organize many more uh, such programs in future. Uh, we are very, very grateful to you for this wonderful talk. Um, Madam, uh, there are no questions. And uh, I'm also thankful to Dr. Eminent uh, Academician and Principal of our National College, Dr. Kamna, Madam, for, for helping us in organizing this wonderful talk. On behalf of KSTA, Dr. Kamna, Madam, thank you very much. Also, thank you, sir. I would like to thank all the uh, faculty and students of Jainagar and Jainagar National College and also from other places. Uh, we are thankful to all of you for your uh, active participation. It would have been nice if you had few questions posed to Madam. Her uh, talk was excellent, really a wonderful talk. Thank you, Madam. Madam, uh, over to Dr. Kamala, Madam. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Canada ke brother because there are so many uh, Canada participants have also joined. So, e lecture na kele danta. Yallarigu National College Jaina garada paravagi ha ko case tiya paravagi. Rupur ko ada dhanne vada gulo Priya aur ko kuda. Priya Shahasan. Nimko Canada dali matun sir help tai devi. To say thank you in Canada dhanne vada gulo. Welcome. Ma'am, I see one question in the chat. JWS is time machine. So I'll just I'll just give one sentence on saying that. Oh, okay, okay. That would be yeah. Yeah. So since there is one question, it would be good to answer that. So uh, like I mentioned to you that because you are looking in infrared, you can look back in redshift. So what happens is you can look at different objects at different redshifts. For example, if you were studying evolution of galaxies, you can see galaxies at redshift one, two, three, four, five. And JWST lets you go back till redshift 20, even more than that. So in that way, Madhusudan, uh, your question, the answer is that in that way, it works as a time machine, that you can observe the same object at different redshifts, right? Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kamla, ma'am. Thank you, Ramesh, sir. Thanks one so name. much. One Nimsha, to say about, I should have been told earlier, to say about Priya, uh, we met Priya, I met Priya in 2019, it seems, first time in Pune. What I observed with Priya is she, her philosophy is never give up. So in her career path, she has gone through so many uh, institutions and learning from one step to another step. Intrinsically, what I saw was the Priya is of a kind never give up. That is a, a lesson to all the students and teachers. Hope I am right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely right. Dr. Yes. Priya, you are a role model for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.